that was that was a very generous uh, description of myself. Uh, thank you for whoever wrote that. That was probably me. Um, again, my name is Pedro. I'm the engineer manager of the office of the CTO. So whatever the CTO comes up uh, with in his crazy mind, we are responsible for uh, delivering that and, and making a product out of it. Um, I'm here joined at OpenSearchCon in Seattle by Alistair, who's my colleague, and Michelle, who is the product manager at Canonico for uh, open search and, and other things, other very interesting things. Um, most people know Canonical for Ubuntu. Who here knows Ubuntu or used Ubuntu? There we go. But Canonical does a bunch of other things. Um, who here uh, pulls images from Docker Hub? As you know, like used, yeah, there you go. I'm sure that a bunch of you. So 72% of the images in Docker Hub are based in Ubuntu images. And we are responsible for uh, all the security patching and bug fixing of those who so have a huge amazing security team, big shout out to them, who uh, is responsible for keeping your um, containers secure. Um, let's dive straight into it. Uh, the first thing, a big, huge, uh, incredibly large disclaimer, I am not by any means an open search specialist. And uh, I don't know what I'm doing here in a convention about open search. Um, but I'm also um, trying to learn about machine learning and AI. And AI. And uh, so if you spot anything that is wrong, uh, please feel free to, to correct me. I am not too proud about uh, anything that, I'm, um, that I might say here. Um, but the thing is that um, I, I, don't, I don't know if I want to be an open search specialist. I don't, I don't know if I want to know every single knob and button to press in open search. Because in the end, open search is a tool. Apologies for, for um, you're um, all amazing developers and contributors, but for, People out there, people that are using open search, they're using open search. They just want it to work. They just want to take their ideas out of the, their brains and use open search as a tool, as a, as a means to an end. Um, and I think this is a little bit what this talk is about, how someone like me had an idea and wanted to use open search to implement it. Uh, a little bit more about myself, as um, I was generously introduced, I live in Avimor in, in the highlands of Scotland, but I'm originally from the south of Brazil. And a uh, curiosity about the south of Brazil is that about 17 years ago, when I first got in touch with open source, uh, only 2% of the, oh, the population there had access to broadband connection, to a broadband connection. And this number was, the, world, the world, worldwide average was like one and a half percent. And in subdeveloped countries, that was much, much smaller. So why am I saying that? Why am I saying that? Because um, by default, the most popular open source project out there 17 years ago was alienating 98% of the world population. I'm, talking, I'm saying that Linux, by default, was not accessible by 98% of the world population. So it, it, it begs a reflection about, was it really open source? Was it really accessible to anyone who wanted to use it? And I'm not, well, it's, 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 it's a very hard problem because we just did not have the broadband technology. It was expensive and, and, and that, that was it. And, and the Linux Foundation couldn't just go and install broadband routers in everyone's houses. That would be uh, not feasible. But there was something else that could be done. Um, uh, Canonico uh, recognized that and started sending CDs to people's houses. I'm sure that some of you here still have some of the CDs or, or got it. And I think that's something really cool. That's a recognition that open source goes beyond uh, just dumping some, some source code on, on GitHub and forgetting about it and just making yourself feel proud that I made open source. No, we need to, as an upstream, we need to stop and think about everything that stops someone from using, from deploying and, and operating your application. So um, this idea for the talk actually started when someone in my team, uh, he works in Italy, he asked me how to add um, my city's anniversary as a holiday to the holiday system in the company. And um, he searched for it, he looked for it, and he couldn't find it. So Canonical is 100 percent distributed uh, around 72 countries, and, uh, but we do respect the regional holidays. So if, you, if there's a city anniversary and everyone in the city is, is not working, that, that person shouldn't work. And we expect employees to, to be adding those holidays to the system. Um, and he couldn't find uh, where in our wiki this information was, was, uh, was, was living. And we have a wiki system because the company was founded in 2004 by a bunch of nerds who love open source. So they just thought, well, let's create a wiki and organically populate it. The problem with organic popula organically populating anything is an, an, an 
unmoderated fashion is that uh, you're gonna have a mess very, very soon. So uh, currently our HR has bet way better ways to communicate policies, but the wiki still holds strong as a source of knowledge. So um, I did what any reasonable person would do and I went searching for alternatives to that. And that's the kind of thing that I've, 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 I've found. And that's scary, I'm not gonna lie, I'm not gonna pretend. I feel overwhelmed with the current landscape for AI ML. It is very, very hard to know exactly where from here uh, you're gonna find the solution for, um, for your problem, for the answer for what you're trying to find. Um, so my question, the problem was not really how to add Holly to the, the booking to the Holly system in the company. The question is really how to build a semantic search that feeds from the data uh, in our wiki. And uh, we thought, of course, getting distracted by all the tutorials and articles and promises that people make on YouTube videos and about AI ML. That's, that's reality at the moment. Um, it's a very fast-paced uh, environment and it's very easy to feel overwhelmed. And as a developer, I just want to have a framework that I can test things quite quickly. I can uh, evaluate what is good, what is not, what's gonna serve me, what is not, what's just gonna be destructive. And um, that was my original problem. And uh, well, that, that's the answer for it. So uh, thank you very much, that's the end of the presentation. Um, no, um, we built something and I think that's, that's quite cool. Um, so now we can ask about how the policies, how the SDRs and sales folks can, can ask about prices of things, about our, how we offer our offerings. Um, and that's quite cool. This is kind of the high level architecture and it doesn't, it changed a little bit since four months ago when we first proposed this. Uh, but the idea is just to have uh, a chat that you can, uh, uh, that you can, uh, a chat application that feeds from our data and uh, uses open search to, uh, to be a vector store. Again, uh, about four months ago, we came up with this idea and there were not many results in Google about how to use open search as a vector storage for um, the specific framework that I'm going to talk about here. And, uh, <laughs> Interesting enough, about two weeks ago when I was the, doing a final check in my slides, uh, there were about 10 results in Google on how to do that, exactly that. So um, if you see this, present so this presentation is uh, repeating something that you already read. I'm not trying to copy anyone, apologies. I tried to put the sources as much as I could. This is canonical generated, by the way. Um, uh, but, um, but the truth is that it's such a fast-facing uh, technology landscape that only adds to, to my, my feeling that I really need to find a framework that allows me to test things quite quickly. So this is um, kind of a summary of what, we, what I'm gonna talk about uh, today. So first of all, I'm gonna give a very gentle introduction to vectors. Um, again, I, I did not really know what vectors were in the context of uh, storing vectors in databases. Um, and I, I think that lots of people out there with great ideas will have to eventually learn this. So um, just as someone once sent me, it's quite philosophical actually, <laughs> just as uh, like someone once sent me CDs through Mayo, I hope that this very gentle introduction to this topic will inspire someone uh, here or who is watching the, the, this recording to actually develop something based on this. So um, that's why I'm giving this, this introduction to it. Um, then I'm going to present uh, the framework that we're using to integrate all the bits and the parts of this chat application. And then I'm going to talk about the thing that I'm really passionate about, the thing that is my, my, the reason why I wake up on a Monday morning, um, apart from my son jumping on my bed, uh, how to operate applications uh, on day two. And um, this is kind of the script for today. So uh, during one of the keynotes today, um, this article was mentioned, and I think uh, I'm not gonna talk too much about it, but if you haven't read it, it's, it's super cool. My point here was not to talk about what the, um, the search philosophy behind it, such as in the, in the keynote, but I really wanted to say that um, there's a very strong case for indexing here. It is, there is a very clear description of what indexing look like, looks like, and that's a very important concept if you want to build a semantic search application with open search. So if you have no idea what indexes are and you like a bit of history, um, uh, this, this article is a quite interesting one to read. Um, again, this is a search um, 
conference, so I would expect that this slide, this part, would be a bit too basic for you folks. If someone stands up and leaves the room, I'm not going to be offended. But the truth is I'm going to reuse this presentation, this demo, in, 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 uh, to folks who are not uh, very familiar with this. So if you're going to be my guinea pigs, just deal with it. Um, if I were to look for Ubuntu rocks on our wiki currently, um, what the search engine would do is just take the word Ubuntu and the word rocks, put these two together and look for documents with that in the title. Well, it's a, it's a bit more elaborate than that. It's going to look for probably uh, some content as well, but essentially it's, it is looking for those keywords. It's not going to go any further than that. Whereas if I am talking about semantic search and I make a question, now I am trying to understand the meaning of the expressions that I use there. So um, the reason to exist can be translated and can be also understood as, as a mission. And the publishers of Ubuntu um, are canonical. By the way, uh, to bring this software to the widest audience is one of the most beautiful sentences that I, I, just, I don't know, I like it a lot. So. The other thing that I thought would be useful was to talk about semantic mapping. Now, semantic mapping is not necessarily uh, the, the, the vectors that you'd store in your in database. Uh, but they do like, the, well, they are, technically they are vectors, but not the ones that you would store in the database. But they're a nice representation that uh, illustrates uh, the relationship between entities and the paths that you can form. Uh, so when you hear vectors and, you have, if, and if you have no idea what vectors are, I, I, would, I would think about something like that. It's not precise, but it is very useful for understanding how to form relationships between entities and, and, and paths. And um, I have, uh, I like GIS and, and, and um, geographical um, analysis, and, and that kind of reminds me of some, of some algorithms or pathfinding. And I don't think that's by accident. I think that the, the graphs in, in maps are very similar to, to the, the problems that we're going to face with vector database. But anyways, just a reflection. Cool. Um, so hopefully I um, went through some basic concepts that I had to, to understand a bit better on the way. Um, and now uh, I want to talk about a nice machine learning framework. In this case, it's Langchain. And um, Langchain is just a framework. There are others out there, but it's one that I chose because it's very plug playable. You can just put the bits that you want, remove the bits that you don't want, and then the next day you just try something else. Um, it goes, it's a framework that helps you to integrate the, the um, AI models with everything else that you need to. Uh, make your um, AI application to work, right? So if you have to work with some data ingestion, if you need to load this data into memory, if you need to transform this data, break it down into chunks, if you need to store it in a vector database and then retrieve it with, with the queries, um, Langchain has wrappers around everything. It has a nice Python API. I think it's really tasteful and really nice to use. Uh, I have not associated with Langchain by, in any way. By, by the way, I just uh, it's a nice open source project. So. Um, there are two things that I like about it. The first one is the orchestration aspect, which is what you can see here. So it organizes in the form of all these wrappers, um, everything that you need to build your application. And the second aspect is the chaining aspect. So it does the chaining of the prompts. So it gives you this very chatty experience that um, keeps the, 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 the ideas flowing, keep the, the uh, question um, is not isolated, it's, it, it is always connected to the previous question and, and uh, a summary of what it does. Uh, if we want to actually write a chat application with it, um, well, actually, you can just go to, to uh, put on Google Langchain and open search, and there is a beautiful notebook on that. Um, so this presentation is only it's simply using, uh, presenting the, the notebook that is already there because the code is much more clear than the code that I wrote for, for, for my chat application. But uh, you're welcome to, we have a booth there on, the, on this wing here. And uh, if you want to talk about the challenges of importing data directly from a wiki, I'm happy to talk about that. So the first thing that you need to do is to prepare your data, of course, or to load this data into memory. And that's exactly what you're doing in the first two lines there. The, and then you want to split your data. Um, and that's because models are not very good at uh, handling huge amounts of data. Uh, well, not necessarily the models, but the infrastructure that is, is, is uh, handling them. So you want to, uh, of course, split that. And there are several ways to do that. And uh, the most common one is just to split it by chunks. 
Uh, the danger with that is that when you're splitting the chunks, you might lose meaning between the chunks or you might isolate them. So you're going to have a bunch of sentences that are not connected together. So your model cannot make any semantic connection between them. So you use, um, use an overlap, right, to, to uh, keep, the, keep the notion that there is a continuity. On the next one, how do we actually use open search of line chain? It, it just import the module. It's, sorry, I, I, I wish this was a bit more exciting, or, or, but it's, 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 it's great that it's just literally just importing the module and, and gives access to all the methods that you need to, um, to get going with open search as a vector um, database. So the next thing would be, of course, to, to create the embeddings uh, object. And um, the cool thing about this is that I'm using Hugging Face here, but you could be using OpenAI or all the other providers that uh, are supported by Langchain. And if you are into AI ML, you see the value of this, which is um, you can just change models and model, pro model providers uh, on the go from test to test with all the headache of trying to understand the difference between the APIs and, 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 and all the adaptations that come with this. So it's again in the same philosophy of I just want to test things, I just want to see if this works rather than being an expert in this, in this tool. So this is actually initializing the object for um, uh, important documents. It's pointing to the open search uh, instance and you need to have an open search instance already. And um, what comes next? You just make a query and, 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 and that's it. Like this was what, 12, 15 lines of, of Python code, very easy to understand. And, and you have your chat and application using, uh, using open search as a vector database. Very simple, right? Well, um, there is still the thing of, of deploying open search because this understands that you have an open search instance here and you're pointing to it. But how do you run open search on your laptop very quickly or um, how do you just quickly run open search? That's the third bit, which is how to operate open search and how to actually deploy it. And there are several ways. I'm sure that you folks have favorite ways. Um, you know, some, some of you use the managed services. Some of you like the Helm charts, the, the Docker Compose option. Uh, but I particularly like two frameworks that we developed at Canonical. By the way, everything that I'm explaining here is open source. Like all the frameworks, all the, the tools. Uh, uh, at Canonical, it doesn't make a lot of sense to, to even use the disclaimer because um, everything is open source first. Uh, but um, just to be clear, all this is framework, so we're developing that um, the code is available. Um, the first one is based on this idea that nowadays the code for run, for the code, the, the source code for applications is available. Everyone has broadband. Everyone can download the project in GitHub. Everyone can go to the, to the, cube, to the Kubernetes repository and just download it to, to their laptop. Now, the challenge is how, what happens on, after you deploy that? What happens after you install it? Do people know how to use it? Um, and you might claim that your documentation is enough for that, but your, your, is your documentation covering most deployment types, most architectures, most um, use cases? Um, I think it's, it's quite impossible to do that. Um, and is it automated? No, it's not. Someone needs to read the document documentation, understand that, and, um, and uh, execute based on that. So the real question for me about open source in the 21st century is how are we going to share information about operating our applications? And now uh, this is a call for action, actually. As an upstream, I think it is our obligation with users or responsibility of users to be caring about how they're going to be operating their software. Cloud native technologies, microservices, they're like organic entities. They need to be deployed, they need to be nurtured, they need to be observed. Sometimes they need to be killed and, and restarted. I hope you don't do that with your animals, but uh, uh, I, sometimes I do that with my microservices. And um, and all these things, they're very difficult. And not only difficult, they're very expensive. Operating software is extremely, operating free software is extremely expensive. 
if you do not have a great level of automation going on there. So this is my, my um, this is the idea behind this framework that we developed at Canonical. Juju is the orchestrator and charms are the, um, the, the artifacts that the orchestrator orchestrates. Um, so what a charm is essentially, it is a charm deployed in Kubernetes, uh, the architecture of a charm deployed in Kubernetes. Um, we are working on the charm for, for um, open source that can be deployed in Kubernetes at the moment, can be deployed on, on VM clusters. But um, anyway, so that, this is a very, uh, I like showing the Kubernetes version because it's, uh, the pod is a very nice, uh, gives a very nice notion of unit. So um, when you deploy something, this is one unit, one um, replica of your uh, pod with open search. You're not only deploying the application, you're also deploying the instructions on how to run this application. So the charm container, it, these are two sidecar containers, by the way, the sidecar container and Kubernetes are quite um, well studied thing. Um, you're not only deploying the application, you're deploying the, the instructions on how to deploy this application. So um, because they're in the same pod, the charm container has full control over the workload container. And that's super cool because you can have very low level control over, what, over what's going on there. And I'm not saying that, again, you know, I don't contradict myself. I, I don't want to have this low level control, but I want the open source specialists who are writing this Python code and creating the wrappers for me to use to have this low level control. The other cool thing about it is, is because there are two sidecar containers is that when you add units, you add units to, to this deployment, your, um, your operations code is scaling with, um, with our uh, workload containers, with our applications, so we never lose track of, of, of what's going to have full control over your deployment. This is very focused on distributed systems, right? The Juju and Charms, there are four distributed systems for your open stack, for your um, um, Kubernetes, for your um, Oracle, Oracle Cloud, for whatever Red Hat is doing these days, and, and, and so on. So, um, VMware, and, and we're very cloud vendor agnostic. We do not necessarily want you to use our distribution of Kubernetes or so on. If you have your laptop, we have a snap for it. And um, probably some of you have an opinion on Snap, but I would invite you to leave your Reddit account a little bit out of the room for a second and uh, hear me out here, okay? I really think that uh, successful open source needs to be opinionated. If it's not, it's not useful. If it is just a blob of things that do not have an opinion on it, uh, of how to, to run, how to deploy, then it's gonna be very difficult to operate and it ends up being useless or useful just for one, one person who creates that. So I'm not saying that snaps are perfect for everyone, but they are easy to use. You just deploy it, all the dependencies, all, you just install it, all the dependencies come with it, they're isolated, they're safe, we, keep, we make a security promise on them. Um, they are available on 40 plus Linux distributions. Uh, we have a store, there's a, a concept of epochs and a concept of uh, channels. It's a very po powerful backend. Um, and we're creating a snap for open search, meaning that if you have a Linux uh, machine, you can just do a snap install open search and you have open search. You don't need to care about anything else. And again, you wouldn't want to run your snap as a production instance because it's just one, it's a cluster with one replica equals to, to one. Now, my use case is super cool, modest aside, because I have a button on VS Code. Yes, I use VS Code, excuse me. Um, that when I click, it spins up an Ubuntu VM, installs the snap in it, and now I have a completely sandbox open search environment. If things go wrong, I have a purge button and I never see that, that, that VM again. That's delicious, because all the dependencies are like so tight and, and, and my, my system keeps, uh, stays clean. Um, anyways, uh, so, this is another cool thing about snaps uh, is that the concept of add-ons. So uh, I've witnessed in the round table here a bunch of discussions about what should be the atomic installation of open search. Should it be the minimum installation? Should it include dashboards? Should it include the whole of GitHub? Um, with snaps, you can just, by default, install uh, the, to provide the minimum installation and people can just do um, open search snap, open search enable, dashboard, snap, open search enable, security. And now, you have um, 
yours not grows, your installation grows. So we don't need to care a lot. And the user does not add any operational overhead to what the user is doing. The other cool thing is about both about snaps and charms is that they are um, their release uh, follows um, follows some very predictable mechanics. So you can we we're, we're always tracking upstream, and uh, ideally, eventually, when we finish a few things that we have to do in our engineering teams, we're gonna release an edge version a few hours after there is an upstream release, and that's an edge version and tested, and then someone who tests and releases a stable version within a few, some time. I'm not gonna promise anything here, otherwise Michelle would just jump on the stage and, and, and kick me. But um, that's the idea behind it, right? Uh, you can automate the, the release of these artifacts based on the release of upstream on, on, because you have the concept of edge, of, of channels. Uh, people who are using edge, uh, really edge, uh, the people who installed both the charm and, and the snap via the edge channel, they'll get immediate updates. So, so it's an interesting accelerated um, environment for testing. Some final thoughts with a lot of extra time. Right? Um, I think that OpenSearch is really well positioned to be a reference in the AI ML landscape. And I'm not talking about um, being the best vector database or being the best uh, whatever it replaces in, in, this, in this technology. I'm talking about, you know when sometimes you have a favorite place to look, uh, look for documentation for a certain technology? In my case, when talking about Linux and Ubuntu, I do not, don't tell my boss that, I do not go to the Ubuntu documentation page, I go to the DigitalOcean page, because I think they do an amazing job. Whoever is responsible for the documentation there should, should get a prize. Um, and that's kind of how I learn. I just read through the application notes, read through the tutorials, through the notebooks, and that's how I build my, my knowledge. That's how I know how to um, fix a problem in my Ubuntu machine. In a way, I think that because we have a really great community, a really, really welcoming community, uh, we have really great documentation, um, I think that we have the opportunity in our hands here to be this beacon of sanity in this landscape, where people are gonna enter the AI ML world through the vector database, uh, through, through open search. And I think that as, as the upstream community, or mostly, uh, most of you here can contribute to, to open search upstream, we should always be thinking about um, uh, contributing to the documentation, making that very rich, because I think that's a, a, an entrance door for open search and for other technologies around it. And, um, also think about how people are operating it. Think, think about how people are gonna use it in real life. Um, do not assume that people are as smart as you are in terms of using open search. Um, because if we really want this to work, we're gonna to have to pe hold people by the hands and, and, and show them how, how it works sometimes. Otherwise, it's just gonna be in a bubble. And, and I'm not saying we are at the moment, but it's always something to watch. It's good to be reminded of that that uh, we always need to look, look for the folks who still do not know what open search is, who still do not know what um, a vector database is, and you need to offer a hand for them to learn these things. Cool. Um, if you have any questions, if you want to um, uh, give me some feedback or uh, talk about, about the canonical, canonical things um, or open source in general, uh, please, you can reach me out on, on, on an email and our, our GitHub. Um, this is the link for our open search page within Canonical. Um, thank you very much.